Welcome to Guide to Operating Systems 4th Edition. This is Chapter 3, Operating Systems Hardware Components. In today's lecture, we're going to explain the operating system hardware components. This is going to include the design type, speed, cache, what an address bus or data bus or even a control bus is, and we're going to talk about CPUs and CPU scheduling. We're going to describe the basic features and system architecture of popular PC processors, and we're going to understand how hardware components interact with operating systems. So let's go ahead and get started. First and foremost, let's talk about CPUs. The whole system architecture of a computer in general is built around the CPU. Now when we talk about system architecture, we're talking about the number and type of CPUs in the hardware, all of the communication routes or buses as we refer to them between the CPUs and other hardware components. All of this is generally referred to as the system architecture for a system. The CPU or central processing unit is simply the chip in the computer that is responsible for processing or doing the actual computational and logical work for that system. Systems can have multiprocessors or multiple processors. We generally refer to these as multiprocessor computers. And that simply means that they have a multiple physical CPU chips within the system itself. Now each CPU has a core. A core is the section of the processor that actually does the reading and execution of instructions. And processors generally only had one core to start with. But a multi-core processor, which is not uncommon today, has two or even more cores. Now in addition to the core, or the control unit in some cases, there are two essential typical components of a CPU. There's the arithmetic logic unit, or ALU, which performs the arithmetic and logical operations, and the control unit, which extracts instructions from memory and decodes and executes them. It only calls on the ALU when necessary. Now a CPU can be classified by hardware elements, the design type, the speed of the CPU, how much cache or onboard memory that CPU has. The address bus, the data bus, and the control bus, we'll talk about those in a minute, and CPU scheduling. So let's look at each of these in more detail. Now the CPU design type, well today there are generally two CPU designs. There's the Complex Instruction Set Computing, or CISC, and the Reduced Instruction Set Computing, RISC. RISC is actually the predominant design type in today's market, but we'll talk about CISC as well. There's still plenty of CISC chips out there. Before we get into that, I do want to remind you that when we go back to, say, the ENIAC or these systems where you had to rewire things, they didn't have CPUs. And a computational unit does not necessarily have to have a CPU. It can be distributed, say, among other or big systems. Uh, but in general, most computers have a CPU to do most of the computational processing. The main difference between a complex instruction set and a reduced instruction set is the number of different instructions a chip can process. CPUs can process on the low end 20 million to the high end of several billion operations per second. Now an instruction set, before we go much deeper, is simply the list of commands the CPU can understand and carry out. Let's look at CISC and RISC in more detail. How does a CISC CPU operate? Well, CISC tends to be software driven. That means that when the CPU gets a command, it assigns specific instructions to different parts of the chip. When a command is finished, the next command is received, and then the CPU has to reprogram the same parts of the chip it used before in order to execute those commands. Now there's some advantages to CISC. For instance, CISC chips only need general purpose hardware on board to carry out commands versus the hardware for a specific purpose. And since the chip is driven mainly by software, that means it's cheaper to produce. There are disadvantages to CISC as well. 
The complexity of the on-chip software needed to make hardware do the right thing, for one and the need to continually reprogram the on-chip hardware in between instructions. That means that the CISC chip will be a little slower than RISC chips. And we'll look, see more of that in just a minute. So, because general hardware is used, functions will not be executed in the most efficient way. Hardware modules, however, can be added to optimize or to perform certain functions. For example, a math coprocessor, which can be added in order to help with all those computational functions. Now, that's going to increase the price and it's going to uh, improve the performance of the CPU as well. Now, let's contrast that to the RISC chip. A RISC CPU operates typically by using a technique we refer to as pipelining. This allows the processor to operate on instructions while it's retrieving more instructions from the operating system or the application. Now, the advantage of RISC, of course, is that it requires very little software setup for specific tasks because it has all that hardware built onto the chip itself that's firmware set to do specific functions. The disadvantage of RISC, of course, is that you have to have that hardware, and hardware tends to make the chip more expensive. This chart does a pretty good job of showing you how a CISC chip works in relation to a RISC chip. For instance, a CIS chip in this demonstration has five multiplications in 20 ticks. Why? Because it has to do each of these steps sequentially. While a RISC chip through pipelining can do five multiplications in eight ticks, thereby significantly improving the speed of the processor. The RISC processor design, now it has evolved into a concept we typically refer to as explicitly parallel instruction computing, or EPIC. EPIC was designed as a joint project by Intel and Hewitt Packard, and it enables the processor to handle massive numbers of operations simultaneously by implementing large storage areas and executing parallel instruction sets. The chip can predict and speculate which operations are likely, and it can support up to 256 64-bit registers. It also reduces or eliminates bottlenecks at the processor. Another way that RISC-based EPIC processors work is how it interprets instructions. For instance, a RISC EPIC processor has the capability of building three instructions into one word. Now, word, when we refer to a word in this instance, we're referring to a single communication with the processor. CISC and traditional RISC chips are pretty straightforward, one instruction per word. But EPIC instructions can be combined into instruction groups consisting of multiple words. It attempts to execute all of the instructions in one group at the same time, thus making the RISC-based EPIC processor a lot faster than CISC and even traditional RISC chips. One of the defining characteristics of a CPU is its speed, and the speed of a CPU defines basically how fast it can perform operations. The most in obvious indicator of a CPU is its internal clock speed, which provides a rigid schedule to make sure all the chips know what to expect and at what time. It tells how many clock pulses or ticks are going to be available per second. The faster the clock, the faster the CPU. As more components are needed to make a CPU, the chip uses more energy. That's going to be converted into heat. If you don't believe me, feel the bottom of your laptop. CPUs oftentimes require fans to keep cool, particularly the modern CPUs today. A CPU must be able to communicate with other chipsets on the computer. Virtually every device on the computer is driven by some sort of chip, 
It uses external clock speed to communicate with the rest of the components on the computer. External clock speed is going to run slower than the internal clock speed. Anywhere between one eighth the speed all the way down to one half of the speed of the internal CPU clock. Since the internal clock of a CPU is faster than that external clock of the CPU, the CPU typically would have to wait on information to arrive from other parts of the computer. Everything around the computer is just running so much slower than the CPU. It's like slow motion to it. Well, we've come out with a solution for that. Most modern CPUs have what we call cache memory built into the chip. This memory is extremely fast, partly because it's located on the chip itself, and it typically runs at the same speed as that processor. We categorize cache memory. Cache memory is referred to as level 1 cache. Now, some CPUs have two or even more levels of cache memory. We call that level 2, or even in some cases, level 3 cache. It normally runs at the same speed as the external CPU clock. In many cases, up to 90% of data the CPU needs to transfer to and from memory is present in the L1, L2, or even the L3 cache. A cache controller is needed to predict what data will be needed and makes the data available in the cache before it's actually called upon by the computational processor. Intelligent, fast cache controllers and large amounts of L1, L2, and L3 can help really increase the speed of a central processing unit. Let's talk a minute about address buses. An address bus is the internal communications pathway that specifies the source and target addresses for memory reads and writes. And it's going to run at the external clock speed of the CPU. Generally, the wider the bus means it can address more memory and store more data. And the width of the address is the number of bits that can be used to address memory. PCs today use 32 and 64-bit address buses. A 32-bit address bus allows them to address 4 billion memory addresses, while the newer processors use a 64-bit address bus to do this, and that allows them to address up to 16 terabytes of memory. Computers also have a data bus. The data bus allows computer components such as the CPU, display adapter, the main memory, virtually every component on the computer to share information. The number of bits in the data bus will indicate how many bits of data can be transferred from memory to the CPU in one clock tick. A CPU with an external clock speed of 1 GHz and 64-bit data bus could transfer as much as 8 gigabits per second. A CPU with a 64-bit data bus typically can perform operations on 64 bits of data at any given time. Information is transported to the control bus to keep the CPU informed about the status of resources and devices connected to the computer. Memory reads and write statuses are transported on this bus as well as all the IRQ requests or interrupt requests. An IRQ is a request to the processor to interrupt whatever it's doing to take care of a specific process, which in turn may be interrupted by another process. And just because an IRQ is sent doesn't mean it interrupts immediately. CPU scheduling helps take care of that. It determines which process to start given the multiple processes waiting to run. It prioritizes them. And beginning with Windows NT, the use of CPU scheduling algorithms really began to evolve. And it began to allow something called multi-threading. Multi-threading is the ability to run two or more processes or threads at the same time. 
let's take a minute to go over some of the more popular PC processors. A lot of companies have developed processors over the 30 plus years or so, but there are some processing companies that stick out over the long haul. Intel, for instance, is the single most popular CPU manufacturer producing CPUs today. It started off with the 8088, which was an 8-bit processor. It was found in the original IBM PC in 1981. Early Intel processors began to be identified by model numbers, including the 8088. Then we went to the 8086, which came out in, I don't know, 76, 78. Then we moved on to the 8286, the 386, and the 486, which was often preceded as an I, as an I-486. The Pentium family of chips followed the 486 and are sometimes identified with a P and a number, P4 being one of the primary examples. And Intel later came out with the Itanium and Itanium II. There are newer 64-bit processors for high-end PCs and servers. However, Itanium is beginning to be phased out, and support through Microsoft is being phased out for this as well. Here's an example of some popular PC processors. As I said before, the 8088 and the 8086 and, uh, were one of the first sets of processors that Intel put out. The 8286 is where we began to see the whole uh, x86 phenomenon take hold. It originally started in 1982. The 386SX chip came out in 1985. It was less expensive than other versions of the 386 chip, and it supported only 16-bit data buses. The DX is where we switched to the 32-bit data bus on CPUs and we came out with a less expensive version of the 486 chip in 1989. It only supported a 16-bit data bus. Pentium came onto the market in 1993, as well as Pentium Pro in 1995. The Pentium Pro was optimized for running 32-bit instructions, and Intel also released the Multimedia Extension, or MMX, with new instructions to deal with multimedia. Did it added cache or L1 cache onto the chip? The Xenon came out in 1998 as well as the Celeron. Pentium 3 and 4. The Pentium 4 had two math coprocessors built into it. The first risk based Intel Itanium chip came out in 2001. 64 bits with epic architecture. That, along with the Itanium 2, were generally designed for high-end PC workstations said servers. In 2001, Intel developed the Itanium processor. That, along with its cousin, the Itanium 2, are different in two respects. First of all, this is the first time we start seeing RISC-based epic architecture integrated into the processor. There are also 64-bit chips designed for high-end systems, computer servers, and high-end workstations. In order to use the capabilities of 64-bit processing, the operating system and applications then had to be rewritten to use 64-bit. Windows XP, Windows Server 2003 Enterprise, and 2003 Data Center, as well as 2008, can be run on Itanium 64-bit processors. However, they may not make full use of the 64-bit compatibility, with the exception of Server 2008. Initially, processors were developed with one core, but today we have many multi-core Intel CPUs available. Let's talk about a few of them. This table shows you some of the multi-core Intel CPUs that are available. Starting in 2005, the Pentium D had two cores. Then we came out with the Xeon, the Itanium, and then we moved into the Intel Core Solo in 2006. It had one core, whereas the Duo had two cores. In 
The Pentium Dual Core was very popular for a time. It came out in 2007. And lately, we see the Intel Core i3, i5, and i7. The i7 originally came out in 2009 with 4 to 6 cores. It can go up to 3.33 GHz. It had a very fast bus speed and a cache of 4 to 12 MB. The Intel Core i5 and the i3 came out to produce mid to lower range PCs uh, to go on the market. They tend to be slower, have fewer cores, and they also have less cache. Advanced Micro Devices Incorporator AMD is a direct competitor with Intel. It also manufactures CPU chips. Here are some of the processors that AMD came out with. The K6, the K6-3, which were equivalent to the Pentium 2 and the Pentium 3, the Duron, which was sim similar to the Celeron, the Athlon, Athlon Model 4, the Athlon XP was a very popular chip. It was compatible to the Pentium 4, and now the Opteron, or 64-bit chip, which is comparable to the Itanium chip. The multi-core AMD processors include the Athlon 2, the Phenom 2, the Phenom, which has 3 to 4 cores, the Athlon X2, the Opteron 4000 series, which allows up to 12 cores, and the Opteron 6000 series, which has 6 cores. Let's talk about some other processors that you may find out in the workplace. Motorola used to make chips for the Macintosh computers, or even older Unix computers, but they're all discontinued now. PowerPC was a newer line of chips that used different instruction sets than the Motorola line. It was originally developed jointly by Apple, IBM, and Motorola, but in 2005, Apple moved to using Intel chips. Spark Scalable Processor Architecture is a RISC processor designed by Sun Microsystems. You still see Sparks out there quite often. Spark T3 is the current version of the Spark processor. It's a 64-bit chip with 64-bit address and data buses. Alpha is another chip you may run into. It's designed by Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC. It was purchased by Compaq, which was then purchased by HP. Uh, it's found in older, high-end HP and Compaq servers. It has a 64-bit data and address bus. It was the first chip to reach a speed of 1 gigahertz. It's kind of its big notoriety. Found in computers uh, conducting heavy networking, engineering, graphic duties. Those were the original target audience for this type of chip. And they were, there were many proprietary devices, file servers, firewalls, and routers that ran custom operating or firmware operating systems based on the Alpha architecture. Well, that's pretty much it for this chapter, so let's summarize it. Hardware and operating systems are interrelated because many ways they grew up together. The processor hardware improvements have marched steadily from the early 8088 chip, that 8-bit chip, to the modern 64-bit multi-core processors, those i3, i5, and i7 processors. Operating systems paralleled these changes to take advantage of the hardware capabilities at each stage of the development. Windows 7 is a prime example of that. The early computer operating systems were well suited to the early processors, but as processors became faster and more advanced, so did the operating systems. Today, 64-bit processors provide a foundation for operating systems like Windows 7, Mac OS X, Snow Leopard, and Linux Fedora to take advantage of the high-speed networking and the multimedia capabilities available today. Multi-core processors bring greater capabilities and functionality to server operating systems as well. That's it for Chapter 3. Next week, we'll talk about Chapter 4, File Systems.